folks and oh we're uh, fantastic thank you Annika for remembering to hit the record button uh, I was just saying we've got a great agenda we'll hear from uh, folks about the in-person convening we had and then we have a special guest speaker today Nan Travers with Credential as you go uh, she'll be uh, telling us more about about her initiative and, and the work going on there um, I'll have some time to do a little brief summary about uh, technical procurement uh, processes related to our, our work here as a group and our charter. And then uh, we plan to have some sharing time for all of you uh, in some breakouts, smaller group breakouts. Uh, a lot of our agenda uh, this quarterly has kind of adjusted, I think, too, from the feedback we got from folks in the in-person event and uh, not to steal the, the thunder there, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Annika and Rachel so they can uh, share with you some of the learnings from that event. Rachel. Thanks so much, De Jeff. Um, Annika and I do have just a couple of slides that we wanted to share in order to document the fun that those of us who attended in person the MCTA convening in October. So just uh, give me a moment here so I can share my screen with you um, and get this slide deck started. So we did have uh, two days to share our learnings and hear from states across the Midwest share the wonderful credential transparency journeys and work that they have been undertaking over this last year and a half. Our convening was on October 10th and 11th, and Dr. Blake Flanders gave a great keynote address talking about the work in Kansas to uh, really embrace credential transparency and align it to the goals uh, within the state. All of the states and organizations that received an MCTA mini grant also provided a showcase. Uh, Kansas shared about their prototype for military transfers and the publishing of their AOK -OK data to the registry. Minnesota was able to share about their planning uh, to align credential transparency efforts to the work to find um, technology solutions that cut across their credit and non-credit programs. We heard from Ferris State and the work that they're doing to ensure that data on their credentials are published to the registry. Indiana shared with us a sneak peek of their school finder tool and the outreach that they're doing to independent organizations and institutions that represent um, underrepresented students in really showing the value of getting credentialing information into the registry. And Miami University shared their progress towards publishing micro credentials. We also had great breakout sessions on career and technical education pathways. And Jeff led a session on technology for credential transparency. And then we asked all of you to share what your goals are in this work for the next year which uh, Annika and I will be walking through in a minute, but I wanted to point out that all of the recordings from the event and all of the presentations were shared are available online. And so you can go uh, to the website listed and the website that will be shared in the chat and explore all of these resources. Especially, I would encourage you to listen to the keynote and join the mini grant showcase session to hear about all of the leading work that states in the Midwest are doing. As I mentioned, we turned it over to you in the last half of that meeting to really capture information on what your goals are for the MCTA in the next year. And what we overwhelmingly heard was a real desire to keep connecting on a regular basis and to also think about who isn't at the table from your states and institutions who might benefit from being connected to this credential transparency work. There was also interest in continuing to learn about credential engine tools like our credential transparency description language and our registry. And I would like to encourage all of you 
uh, this December 7th to join Credential Engine in our annual convening and also our fifth year anniversary. We will have great sessions um, in the afternoon that cover everything from what states are doing, some examples of new tools that states are making available to students and learners around credentials and learning opportunities, as well as hearing what some of the cutting edge work on credential transparency will look like in the future and globally. Uh, there was an also an interest to connect other national initiatives to the work that we're doing together. And that includes um, Credential As You Go. So we're happy to have uh, Nan join us for a presentation today, as well as work that many states are doing on defining quality or credentials of value and other initiatives. Uh, tech integration continues to be a big theme and topic and uh, Jeff will be telling us more about that later on this meeting. And there was also an interest in a marketing toolkit and deciding from uh, a Midwest state perspective if there is standards or guidance around micro credentials and their outcomes. I'll turn it over to Annika for the next overviews of what we discussed at the convening. Thanks, Rachel. So our second um, activity and discussion was around ideas for interstate and interregional collaboration. Um, folks were really interested in um, continuing this as a Midwest organization, but also in having their own um, state specific convenings where they could bring more folks to the table within the state to connect across, um, across and within the state on the work around credentials and credential transparency. Um, we also heard a lot of information about folks wanting to work with um, their industry associations, especially in regards to the pathways work that they're doing and making more of those connections um, between the different kinds of licenses and certifications and things that are sort of industry standard and making sure those types of things also make their way into the registry so that um, our higher ed um, partners can connect um, their work into those in, and the types of things that they're doing in the higher education environment into um, the preparation for those industry accepted um, licenses and certifications. Um, folks talked a lot about regional employer partnerships along the same vein. So um, bringing their regional employers into the conversations around credentials, um, again, um, helping to build those robust pathways between um, higher education and workforce. Um, we talked about um, taking some opportunities to present at other conferences on the work that the different states are doing um, and the sort of innovations that they're having at the state level and encouraging um, encouraging all of you to um, put proposals in and to get the word out about the great work that you're doing. And then um, Rachel already mentioned the EdTech procurement um, has been an opportunity that we'll continue to pursue and that um, Jeff will again talk a little bit more about today. Um, but seeing whether there's opportunities for MEC um, to support uh, procurement activities um, in terms of setting up sort of master contracts that could be applied um, across multiple states. Um, and then finally, um, transfer is always and continues to be a hot topic. Um, and how can credential transparency really facilitate transfer um, was, a, was another way uh, to keep the conversation going across and between states. Next slide, Rachel. And then finally, our final um, discussion, we talked about what could we be doing better to organize um, this alliance um, and to support this alliance. Um, so some of the ideas here um, focused in on, again, bringing more people to the table. So there's sort of a sense that we didn't quite have everybody in the room that should be in the room yet. Um, so you know, definitely encourage all of you that are here to reach out to your colleagues, um, to reach out to your partners, whether those are um, employer partners, regional partners, um, K-12, um, your legislators, whoever whoever is interested in impacting some of this work to come and join this conversation and to participate, sign up for our mailing lists, look at some of the resources we've put out. Um, folks are very interested in continuing to engage with each other and to keep, um, keep meeting on a regular basis, um, having opportunities again to share um, and to uh, talk with each other. So we're trying to we'll work that into the agenda today and going forward. Um, and then, um, you know, continuing uh, 
this community of practice and perhaps providing some mechanisms for folks to talk with each other in between meetings um, and to, uh, to reach out to others. Um, Oh, and sorry, I skipped over the, the goals framework for state participation. So um, some folks were interested in um, having, um, having a framework that would allow them to sort of set, you know, some goals around tr credential transparency. Uh, so that's something that we can continue to talk about uh, supporting in, in terms of what credential engine can provide in their sort of state, um, state collaboration efforts. Rachel, did I miss anything that we want to add? We covered everything. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah, so we had a great meeting. It was wonderful to get together with folks in person. It was great to be able to pipe folks in virtually who couldn't be there in person. Um, hopefully, we had good feedback from the folks that filled out our evaluation. So hopefully, if you were there, it was productive. Um, and if you weren't, again, I can't um, stress to please check out all of the materials and the recordings and things. I think you'll find um, great value in some of those conversations. Thanks so much. Um, Jeff, am I turning it back to you to introduce Nan? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Let's uh, take a moment here just to see if anyone had any questions or feel free to put any uh, info in the chat if you were uh, either attending or uh, online viewing. I appreciate uh, your thoughts on, on our summary. Uh, but um, as you're thinking of that, uh, I'd like to introduce Nan Travers. Nan has been a great leader in the credential space for many years and uh, has agreed to come and share with us some more detailed information about credential as you go. And I'd asked her in particular, just for my own uh, uh, personal interest in the work about the role of technology, because I do think there's an opportunity here that uh, we in the MCTA could all benefit from collaborating uh, more with Nan on. So uh, Nan, I'll just turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everybody for having me. I'm just gonna take a second here to share my screen and we will start. So I, I just wanna give a little bit of a background um, around Credential As You Go. And just to start, um, I just wanna recognize um, Holly Zanvel, who's on the call here as well today, who is one of our co-leads. And also I know that um, Larry Good and Melissa um, Goldberg are also part of this group and they are our other co-leads. So we have a um, kind of a three, um, group that we're leading this together. Um, the This really is, we're thinking of it as a movement in terms of transforming the nation's credentialing system uh, to improve the education employment outcomes for all learners. And I wanna just begin with a little bit of a background um, and the what I'm going to cover in these four drivers of change are not going to be anything new to this group because you've already been thinking about these and none of the numbers should be um, new to you at all. So I'm actually going to go through it very quickly so that I can talk a little bit more about the program and then um, address a little bit about on the technology, but I'm hoping to leave mostly time for some discussion. Uh, so we see kind of four drivers of change that we have a de degree centric system and um, still with Within the workforce being recognized on the degree side, that equity is an issue, that we've got credentialing expansion and a 21st century workforce needs. And when we bring all that together, we really see some changes. So when we think about where we are with degrees, um, this is out of the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, we're still seeing that the, um, the amount of money people earn is related to what degree they have. So the higher the degree, the higher the earnings. And in reverse is that we see that the higher um, unemployment rates go with people with lower degrees or no degree at all. And so um, we really see this inverse relationship that still emphasizes how much we're dependent on the degree um, to be driving some of the workforce. When we look at um, the adult population for the post-secondary attainment in this country, um, there's a little bit more, there's 52% that do not have any um, college credential and 48% 
that have um, a college credential, if I round that to 50-50, we're, we're really just a teeny bit um, better than the global numbers on this, but not, not much better um, in terms of global average. Um, so when we look at the group that has no credential, um, the number that you know we're all familiar with, the 39 million that have some college and no credential, if I average that out and kind of reduce it down, that comes out to one out of every six adult in this country. That means if it's not in your own family, it's a neighbor, it's the person before you or behind you in the um, grocery store. And so really when we think about the magnitude of one out of every six adult in this country, that somehow college has not um, address the, the the credentialing of that learning, um, it really helps us start to put it into focus. Out of that um, other half of no credential, two out of six have no, really no um, uh, post-secondary credential. Um, they've had no college experience at all. And yet, what we see and the reason that they are a lighter color there is that they become um, kind of invisible to the workforce when you don't have a degree. And we so we really see um, some differentials here. Also, those that have a college degree, um, the numbers there are just in terms of looking at it by race and ethnicity, um, we see huge differentials. We also looked at within groups with this and um, with the in group, um, the um, we start to see kind of some different patterns of what's happening within any particular group. The number, um, the, the black adults have the highest number of some college and no degree. Um, and they also are carrying the highest debt load. But we also look at the contrast between our white adults and our Latinx adults in terms of those that are degreed or those with um, high school or less. And we almost see just the opposite in numbers. So we really do have an equity issue here. Um, thanks to Credential Engine, um, we have a sense of the um, unique credentials across this country. And, you know, we're, we're just under a million that they have in their database. So we really know that there's a lot there, but there's such variety that we also have to be thinking about what's the messaging around all these unique credentials and how do we help people make sense of all of that. Um, we also know with the 21st century um, competencies that are needed out there, um, that really being able to signal those competencies and helping people um, be able to um, have that transparent um, becomes a, a really critical. I just read a, a, a research study coming out of Iceland uh, where they are um, using credentialing as a way to document these 21st century competencies that are um, for individuals that have not been successful in post-secondary education. And they um, have had quite a few hundred people go through this uh, process and are finding very high percentages of the individuals able to go and then uh, acquire work or continue their education. So being able to document these becomes really critical. So I'm going to move now to just, you know, those were the drivers that we were really looking at as we went into this project. And then as we start to look at, um, you know, the credential as you go as um, really a, a movement, but as an initiative, we've had three phases of funding, um, two of them that we're still in. So the first phase was through Lumina Foundation, and that was a planning grant. And in that, we did an analysis across um, what are the different kinds of credentials that are happening in the United States? And that was, you know, between 2019 and 2021, which actually now is kind of old, old data when we think about the credentialing world. Um, and from that, we saw patterns in the ways that that credentialing was happening. We did some prototyping and we did some um, professional development and technical assistance in that phase. Then we moved into phase two, where we currently are in the middle of where um, halfway through this second year of a three-year grant, 
And um, that one is through um, IES, through the US Department of Education. And in the focus of this one is really prototyping research and also a national campaign. Um, as part of that, we continue working. We're working with uh, tw 21 institutions that are across three states, which are Colorado, North Carolina, and New York and um, working with um, those 21 institutions in developing all kinds of incremental credentials, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And then um, we also have been building out a, an extensive website, uh, credentialasyougo.org, and um, are able to um, really start to work on um, that kind of technical assistance in a different way that's a, a little bit broader. Um, also, um, and I'm, I will turn at the end to um, Holly to talk a little bit about the Learn and Work Ecosystem Library, where we're able to start to pull together all kinds of information um, that is out there around the whole Learn and Work Ecosystem and really trying to um, enable us to have a way that we can really find out information about that. And as Jeff mentioned, we are also looking at technology. Um, and really thinking about what are the technology needs that support incremental credentialing. Phase three, um, which is something that we've just started is through Walmart. And it's also about expansion and scaling. And so as we look at this um, going even further, um, we just closed an RFP process and are um, developing another cohort of um, institutions and two state systems that will be looking at um, developing further on the incremental credentials. As we continue here, um, uh, the, the the major vision that we have is that we really are developing um, a credentialing system across this country that um, formally recognizes different levels of um, credentials and gets us away from being just degree centric and really working on that. And the, really making sure that all individuals are being recognized for the learning that they have, um, their knowledge and skills, and not um, where their knowledge and skills are not being ignored and left on the table. Um, and so it becomes really important to be able to credential learning and actually seal it in and formally say, this is what somebody knows and can do. And from an institution to say, you know, we, we recognize that, we validate it, and now we're credentialing it. That has a lot more of a, a message for that individual with employers and with other educational institutions than leaving it for the learner to have to um, try to demonstrate or justify the kinds of knowledge and skills that they have. Keep hitting the wrong button. So just give me one second here. There we go. So what do we mean by incremental credentials? Um, we really are talking about the whole array of um, credentialing. So there are different names that people are using, such as, you know, micro credentials, uh, badges, all kinds of other things. But also degrees, they they also work along the incremental way or, or certificates. And so really when we, we are thinking of incremental credentialing is thinking about how can we come up with a schema that is that incorporates all of this as a, as legitimate pathways for individuals to be able to be recognized for what they know and can do. Um, so as we look at this, uh, we start to see it in, in kind of uh, multiple ways where prior learning um, can become part of credentials more than what we're doing currently in this country around credit for prior learning. And I'll, I'm going to speak a little bit more about that um, and thinking about workforce learning and all the credentialing that you get from the workforce and how both going in and out of sort of that higher ed environment um, and also thinking about how Incrementally, we can be thinking about smaller credentials, building to certificates, building to degrees, and in between degrees. So all the way up to doctoral degrees. So for example, for a lot of your universities, I'm sure you have a lot of people who are ABD, but we don't formally recognize that as an actual credential. We leave it for the individual to say, well, I almost got it done, but they have a huge body of knowledge and they can't be um, recognized for that knowledge because we're not recognizing them. So we really have to be thinking about how we start to use credentialing to make sure that people are recognized. 
So out of that, we created the incremental credentialing framework. We have um, six approaches. Um, prior learning assessment is part of that. And also um, thinking about how we can do auto award. These six approaches um, do overlap. We're seeing that, that you know they're not some some institutions are approaching it distinctly, but in most cases we're seeing a combination of these approaches. Um, just kind of very quickly, um, the approaches go. The first one is called learn as you go, and um, that's really about upskilling, reskilling, new skilling. It may or may not be part of a degree, but really thinking about the kinds of um, competencies and skills that individuals need, especially around professional development. Add on you go is about specialties, um, thinking about how we start to recognize the, the kinds of specialties that people need. And it may be while they're working on a degree or a certificate, but it may not be as well. Um, stack as you go is what we all have been talking about now for a couple of years of the stackables. Um, but one of the things that we've really noticed um, and, and emphasize in the framework is the thinking about how does that stacking look, you know, across a field? How does it look across, a, you know, a, a particular a discipline um, from entry and exit, but multiple entries and exits? And how does that align also with employment? So we're looking at the, the full stack, not just pieces of the stack. Um, and so that becomes a, a little bit broader of a concept. The fourth one, transfer you as you go, um, is really looking, and, and on your list um, that was just being shared, transfer was a big part there, and this is something that um, is also really important um, to be thinking about how um, these incremental credentials could be used um, for uh, setting up transfer pathways and thinking about the transition from maybe one level to the next. Um, then as we um, also found is that another way that these were being used in the transfer world was um, thinking about um, the, um, the way in which uh, institutions at the same level can be sharing across. So for example, um, we have two community colleges in um, the Credential As You Go that are working together where um, they're both in, in the field of hospitality, but one institution is doing some incremental credentials in one area, um, happens to be beer making, and the other one is in um, wine making. And what they're doing is they're coming together and students from the first institution can take the incremental credentials at the next institution, because the first institution is not going to be able to um, develop, um, you know, if they're doing the beer, they're not able to develop the wine and the wine institution can't develop the beer. I'm just using that one because that's the, the one that we're working with them on. Um, but it enables uh, more to be offered to the, um, the students through a transfer agreement, but it's really across the same level. Um, partner as you grow as the um, fifth one is that, um, we're um, seeing this kind of coming in two ways as well, where incremental credentials as part of it, the workplace learning is being incorporated into the credential. So it might be through a, uh, a form of um, assessment, like prior learning assessment being used or other ways, or it's actually embedded into the credential. We're also seeing where on the higher ed side that they're embedding the, the workplace credentials into the academic piece so that as um, learners are going through the process, they're gaining those credentials. And so um, we're you know, seeing it on both ways, one, one coming into the academic program, the other the academic program going into the workplace. The last one, retro award as you go, um, really is focused um, in, in many ways, or I should say inspired by that 39 million adults with um, some college and no credential because they still have learning. And if it's not sealed within a degree, unfortunately, a lot of institutional policies um, have a time limit on it. And so even if they have it on a transcript, if they're if they're not getting it embedded into a program that's active or in a degree um, during that, you know, five years or whatever the magic number is at that particular institution, 
they're treated as though they don't have that knowledge, yet somebody with a degree, same five years out, is treated as though they do. So we have an inequity here in terms of how we're treating our individuals who aren't able to complete a, um, a degree. So what we really wanted to, um, and we've got some examples of how we're working with institutions, to be able to go back and look at um, you know, what are some of those patterns, such as gen eds, um, where they could be credentialed. And so people who have gone through up to a certain point still have some type of credential to show what they um, know and can do. And that helps them with work and also coming back to school. So when we're really looking at this, um, we're, we're, you know, up against really thinking about a whole continuum of learning as we think about this. I've been uh, recently adopting kind of the European terminology here um, instead of just thinking post-secondary, thinking of it as tertiary, because there's this, um, you know, as we start to go through this um, and we start to identify where learning is sitting on the continuum, we have a tendency of leaving out this section of that's really after the secondary, but maybe before the credit side of the tertiary. So it might be post-secondary, pre-tertiary, which are very entry level, a lot of focus on the 21st century skills there, and also on our continuing ed side where there's a lot of, you know, can non-credit go over to credit? And so as we start to really look at um, some of that entry level, thinking about how credentialing can also capture that, it may not be part of a degree, but that doesn't mean that the person doesn't have knowledge and skills that need to be credentialed that can help them in that pathway for work and for continuing their education. And so some of what we are starting to really see, and we have a couple examples of institutions that are really looking at that pre credit side, but it's after high school and thinking about how the incremental credentials can be documenting that learning as well. Which really leads us into thinking about how prior learning assessment can fit into this. Um, in many of the countries in um, uh, outside of the United States, the prior learning assessment world started out of documenting learning that's happened in the workplace to go towards workplace credentials. In this country, it started from the academic side, but it's time that we start to think about how these two things, the two worlds don't operate as separate, but really think about the integration of that and how we start to think about how we can credential prior learning as well as workplace learning and academic learning and, and bringing those all together. Um, in the first year of our cohorts that we have, as I said, we have 21 institutions over three states. These are the major areas that we're seeing coming up, and we're sort of seeing a theme where healthcare, education, um, technology, and business seem to be some of the driving areas where um, there, there's probably a little bit more experimentation around incremental credentials. Um, this, will, this list will expand as, as we continue into year two. We also are starting to um, move forward on the research aspect of this, and we'll be able to look at learner outcomes going through the incremental credentials. We are already, though, seeing some emerging themes coming out of what we're seeing with the institutions. Some of them are reporting um, that they actually um, have student demand, and it's through the students that they're hearing the need um, for a lot of um, the incremental credentials. We do have um, the very beginning to see that there are increased enrollments around uh, enrollments that are in the incremental credentials. And so that's a promising um, uh, indicator in terms of what we're hoping to see as we uh, fulfill the, the fuller research agenda. Um, a lot of the incremental credentials are really partnering with workforce and thinking about that preparation and integration and also recognizing the 21st century skills as well as field specific skills. And then we also see that um, many of the institutions are really focusing their incremental credentials around the idea of transfer of learning, going into both workplace and further education and building them as stackables. So that takes us right to um, the, the whole question about how does technology really help us with this? And so um, 
uh, Credential Engine is actually helping us with the um, technology piece and, and Jeff is helping us um, uh, with that. Um, and really thinking through in terms of the institutions that are part of the, um, uh, the IES portion of Credential as you go, um, what are the kinds of technology needs that they have? What are the kinds of issues and barriers are they up against um, with their current systems and how do they need to shift? But we also are trying to look at this from um, an ecosystem piece here because is you know we could have all of their learning documented, but if it can't also be used by the employer or by other institutions, then we run into problems. So, you know, I, I know you've all been having lots of conversations around different ways of thinking about comprehensive learner records and the um, learner employment records. Um, but thinking about it in terms of, you know, how do, how do we record that and make that transferable for the learner to be able to take it into different environments and demonstrate their knowledge and skills. But then how do we also help the employers and institutions be able to recognize what that is and interpret it, um, accept it in, be able to you know, translate it to their own environment and be able to award into the systems as well. And that's where we really also, um, things like you know, a credential engine and other, um, you know, really uh, where we have to think about the infrastructure around sort of these national registries that help with that um, interpretation and translation um, without some kind of um, guidance, without some kind of uh, support there, then um, employers and institutions have difficulty interpreting what's on that comprehensive record and also for the learners to be able to understand it much further. A lot of the research in prior learning assessment has shown us that when learners understand what they know and can do, when there's been a way for them to go through a reflective process or um, be able to articulate it in some way, that they tend to do um, much better in terms of transferring it to the workplace and continuing their education. And I'm sure all of you know the Kale research on um, uh, persistence and completion of PLA students versus non-PLA students. So we really, you know, as we start to look at the technology and the technology direction, we, we really need to think about how these are all interplaying together and, um, and how that supports the incremental credentials uh, in such a way that everybody, it becomes very usable for everybody. So, um, all I'm going to say now is that, um, you know, I encourage you to go to our website, credentialasyougo.org. Um, we have a newsletter. So if you go to the website, you can sign up for the newsletter. I really hope you will sign up because um, that's where we're, you know, able to share kind of things that are going on. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and we also have the Learn and Work Ecosystem Library, and that gets launched on December 1st. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing, and um, I'm going to ask Holly just to speak for a minute about the, the library, because this is also a very important piece, especially as we think about how to share information and help, um, help people understand what's going on. So, Holly? Oh, thanks. And I noticed there's some oh, members. and you're on mute, Holly. It says I'm unmuted. I don't, can you hear me? I hear you. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, I don't think your sound is working. Well, Jeff, did you say you could hear me? I can yeah, hear you. Uh, We're hearing okay. Holly, ma'am. Yeah, okay. You're okay, great, thanks. I, I'll just be short. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll... Um, unfortunately, we can't hear you, Holly. Uh, oh, we can okay. hear you. Actually, Holly. I can hear her fine from Wisconsin. Yeah, can, me so, too. Um, I, she's let me just, loud I'll and just clear. Uh, quickly say that um, Holly has been Oh, it's my speaker. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That's right. Okay. Go ahead, Holly, then they can hear uh, you. <laughs> I'll just keep it short because I know you, you all want to uh, talk about uh, lots, of, lots, of, lots of issues. We're having the launch and I'll send, if you haven't seen the invite, we're, you're all invited to the launch of the prototype on December 1. I'll send it to Jeff and he can send it out to you all if you haven't seen it yet. And this is really an opportunity, our first vetting opportunity to look at the prototype Learner Work Ecosystem Library, we've been worried for a long time that it's really difficult to find information about 
the learn and work ecosystem library, there are many uh, fractured websites around. They're not, they don't really tend to refer you to other sites. It's difficult to find good information. And so we've been working on the idea of building a library where we could explain what the learn and work ecosystem is like in the US, uh, information about it. And so there will be four sections at the library quickly. There's a knowledge section that has the, um, uh, comp the, the main components of the ecosystem and then a lot of subtopics or subcomponents. There's special projects or initiatives. What are some what are some of the main initiatives that are underway around the country? You are all are one of them. <laughs> uh, and, and that we're and we're we're coding those by different types. Some are in the employer space, some of them are more in the credential provider space, some are more around career navigation. There is the section on, on um, uh, alliances and partnerships and intermediaries, like who were the key players in the ecosystem. And then there's a fourth, which is an archive. And what you, many of you know, is that some really great websites may have been built primarily with foundation funding, they're project-based websites. And when the funding goes away, the websites either languish and, or they start, they go away. And there's a lot of good information in those. And we want to rescue those and have that uh, information available, particularly for researchers and folks who want to understand where were things 10 years ago, 12 years ago, five years ago, because some of those places are going away. So you will see when you'll be able to get on and look at the prototype, what we have. It's a wiki model. It is not going to be perfect. We don't want it to be perfect. What we want folks to do is say, this is not accurate. Please change it like you would with Wikipedia. You left me out. My intermediary should be there. We, we're going to have a librarian who'll be uh, curating and collecting. This is not a place to, to advertise and market everything that's out there. This is going to be a library with curation and some guide, guidance about what could go with the library. So that's just a quick uh, overview, and we're really excited about it. It is going to serve credential as you go because a lot of the folks working on this want information, but this goes much broader to serve a lot of the efforts that are out trying to improve parts of the ecosystem. And we think information is key and it's even more key now with what's happened with Twitter, where folks may have been sharing good information on Twitter. It's not even clear that any of us are gonna be able to use it or use it well. And what is gonna happen? Where will we go to share information about what's happening? Are we gonna to go to LinkedIn? Are we gonna to go to everyone else's websites? This is really not clear. So anyway, that's enough about that. And I'll be sure that you all get the invite. And the other thing that I just want to mention um, is that we also have um, over 130 people on our advisory board. Um, we're extremely lucky because the advisory board spans um, all different kinds of um, uh, organizations um, that are in the ecosystem. But I just also want to recognize that a few of our advisory board members are on the call here today. Um, so quickly, um, uh, Sarah, um, we've got um, Carolyn, we've got Sally, and we've got Patrick that are here. And I hope I'm not missing anybody because I'm quickly looking around. But um, that will be, you know, they're, um, I think, really important uh, in terms of um, helping us keep in touch with what's happening in a broader way across the country and internationally. Nan, uh, Holly, thank you both so much for contributing, uh, uh, leading so much uh, good work and also sharing it with the MCTA. Uh, a lot of rich connections with many of the parts of the MCTA programming. And so uh, if you get a chance to peruse the comments, I think you'll see a lot of plus ones and acknowledgments of uh, your work there. Uh, let me pause before transitioning. We just have a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Nan or Holly about uh, this work that they presented? I just want to also address um, John has made a comment here that there's an error message that says the uh, site is blocked due to malware. Um, we will check into that right off. Um, it, it's happened before and we were able to clear it up. So I don't know why it's happened again, um, but we will get to that immediately. Yeah, just uh, it worked It worked for me on Chrome, but those things can come up. So thanks, Nan, for digging in. Okay, uh, very good. Well, um, so I think the next part of our agenda, I was going to share a little about our technology related programming of the MCTA. And then we'll have some more breakout sessions where folks can talk uh, more directly in smaller groups. So 
let me go about sharing my screen and um, I can get um, just a note from anyone. Can y'all can y'all see a PowerPoint presentation? Yep, I see yes, you shaking can. your head. Great, thank you, thank you. So um, yeah, this is just a very brief sort of summary. If if you haven't been following along with MCTA's programming related to technology, uh, just as a reminder, this is part of our charter. Uh, we had the idea that we would uh, work as a group to start identifying some of the key uh, technical business requirements that uh, we need in tools and services, and then collaborate together around uh, master contracts and, and procurement processes to make sure uh, that we're building on uh, some of MEC's core capabilities that can drive cost savings and business solutions. So uh, that's a, that's still a great opportunity for us. We've uh, I'll share a couple of uh, highlights that we've um, uh, on progress we made there. Uh, one right off of the bat was this um, work on digital credentials. So uh, we had uh, RFP, MEC issued an RFP for digital credential solutions, uh, got good responses from many different product companies. Ultimately, Parchment was awarded a multi-year uh, contract for that, which resulted in cost savings uh, for any uh, institution that's using that, that contract. Uh, but it also included uh, within that uh, RFP some language about using uh, CTDL. And uh, in, by including that as an expectation in the RFP, uh, products moved, capabilities uh, grew. And uh, Parchment Now has on their site a uh, partnership with Credential Engine. And uh, I took a screenshot here of their product that Ivy Tech is using. Ivy Tech uses MEX master contract. And uh, this is a screenshot of a diploma for a student. Uh, Ivy Tech has published all their credentials to the registry. This is the diploma for an associate's degree. The information here uh, comes through via the registry and includes at the very bottom here, you see this link where it says more detail at Credential Finder. That link enables any uh, consuming tool, uh, well, one, any person to see the information in the registry, but then two, any consuming tool like a uh, applicant tracking uh, system or a, another credential provider that is aware of CTDL, they would be able to parse out the structured metadata about that credential. And so, you know, if that credential has a competency associated with it, if it has a variety of quality assurance claims, a variety of, you know, bits and pieces that would be relevant to a hiring manager, those data are easily found via that link. So that's the capability I think MCTA is uh, moving towards, looking for those opportunities. And we did a lot of investigation around Pathways. Pathways turned out to be the most popular session when we first met. Uh, lots of folks across MCTA are involved in Pathways. We found and documented almost 700 unique pathways across the Midwest region within a one month period. It was not hard to find pathways. Uh, in the analysis of those, we found that almost all of them are being communicated to the public via PDF documents and or websites, unstructured data. Um, there were some that showed evidence of some databases behind them, but most are manually uh, curated and maintained by staff. Uh, and what, and Pretty much all of those pathways contained credentials. So this seems like an opportunity that uh, we could dig into, we could learn more about. I pulled up a quote here from an administrator we talked with. Um, I won't I won't maybe read the whole thing here except to highlight that there is a uh, clearly a desire to uh, have better data on pathways and kind of an overwhelming um, amount of work to do such things in a manual way, so that much of this work is done by hand and via PDF documents. So we wanted to, um, one of the things we did, we wanted to learn more about the market, what kind of capabilities are there in the ed tech market for pathways. And so we released an RFI just this last summer about ed tech tools that can support credential transparency across a credential life cycle. So this could be the very beginning during a design phase. Um, 
could be after credentials are issued, a variety of tools uh, could be relevant to this RFI is very broadly worded. Uh, we did quickly get responses from many different leading organizations. Uh, so that was encouraging. It's an eclectic mix of groups here. I just showed the logos, happy to answer any questions about these in particular, especially if you are using any of these products at your institution and would like to use them to publish data to the registry. That would be something I would love to talk with you more about specifically. But um, I just summarized here our findings that there are many different um, use cases being uh, advanced here. We have uh, course uh, management tools, we have uh, course catalogs, we have assessment tools, competency framework tools, uh, each of which have the capability of, or they claim to have the capability of supporting credential transparency. And, and they do that in a variety of ways. Uh, some of it can be reports that you can get out of their tools. Some talk about uh, API-based integrations that they support, um, and some have worked directly with the registry. So th there's still an emerging um, standard methodologies that, that products are using to integrate uh, credential information in as data and treating it as data and integrating with the registry. So uh, this was all input in some ways to the discussion we had in person in October. So that little session I uh, ran is just an hour long, but we got a good turnout from folks, all of whom were willing to share their engagement with EdTech products. And I think having that kind of dedicated focus time uh, with people face-to-face uh, -face was very productive. They could, uh, folks would share um, use cases that they were supporting and others could talk with them right away about those uh, those use cases that, that they had in common. Uh, there was some energy around, um, I remember a lot of discussion about military transfer as a use case and tools that are being used to help support uh, that kind of, um, it, it in some ways is an incremental credentialing use case where you're getting skills in the military, uh, they're documented in a variety of ways and there's a variety of agreements that are in place about how those skills and competencies or uh, codes, they have a variety of codes, how those relate to credit and um, advanced standing for different degree programs. And managing all of that information can uh, can be tough and, and tools can help. So uh, I just put a kind of summary here of the different use, ca different, uh, use cases and products that had come up in that one hour discussion to give you a sense of the breadth of it. Uh, but in general, the, the, what I took away from it is that people benefited from being frank and, and honest about their technical needs. And so to advance it, there were there's sort of two outputs at, in talking with, um, with uh, Mac and, and Deb Kidwell in particular about this that, you know, to really have that magic like, like we had with the parchment contract we need to both have the supply. We need products that are mature enough to have these kind of capabilities in hand, willing to uh, put their own investment behind uh, that capability, credential transparency. And we can do a better job organizing the demand for those products. So we as buyers of EdTech products could be very collaborative and explicit about our needs for better support for credential transparency. And I think, um, the MCTA can be a forum through which we connect uh, the supply and the demand uh, together. But to do it, uh, as you can tell, because there are so many different products, so many different use cases, we need to be collaborative with one another. And we need to have mechanisms through which we can get focused to have an impact. And so um, so I think that's, that's kind of our next step. I wanted to share with you some of the work Credential Engine's been doing re regarding that. Uh, we do have uh, an EdTech advisory group that we stood up just this last fall. This is a, a revision version of our higher ed advisory group, which has now expanded, but taken this uh, focus on EdTech products. And uh, the idea here is to help um, people who are using EdTech products uh, be more organized and explicit about how those products can be used to publish data to the registry and then use those data for advancing a variety of use cases. And so uh, like all of our advisory groups, it is completely open to everyone. We very much welcome, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, welcome anyone who would like to participate to join. Uh, but 
the general strategy is to just use um, short 12 week projects focused on particular product types to document how those those products can be used to publish data to the registry. And sometimes it involves managing those data, entering those data into the products in a certain way, getting the data back out, doing mappings of the data to the, you know, so it's involved. <laughs> it's not, you're not, it's not automatic, but we think through better documentation, uh, we can help educate the uh, supply side of the ed tech markets. And we can, in so or collaborating with one another, help organize the demand side that the buyers can work together towards towards those products. And so um, our first our first focus has been on open badges. Uh, open badges are widely used. There are uh, literally millions of them in uh, the wild and hundreds of thousands of digital badges uh, open badges are being offered in America. So um, one of the challenges with a badge is that it could be issued for any number, oh, well, a challenge, but a, but also a, a feature of an open badge is it can be issued for any number of things. And, uh, and that's great, except that if I can't understand what the achievement is of that badge, uh, I may not be able to uh, give you full credit or value for that achievement. And so by integrating CTDL information inside of the badge, uh, that information will flow through to the student, the learner, the consumer, the employer, uh, so folks can can get full credit for their achievements. So anyway, um, that that work's been underway for a little bit now. We'll have some resources here in December to share, and then we'll do planning about what to do in 2023. So as you think about what are your tech procurement needs for 2023, you might be involved in strategic planning now. That's kind of a common cycle. Uh, what uh, how might MCTA, uh, how might Credential Engine help uh, bring a bigger frame to those needs and help um, collectively advance credential transparency? Uh, so I think that is the gist of what I wanted to cover on tech procurement. A lot there. Um, what I will do is uh, stop sharing and just see if folks had any um, any questions and or any uh, tech procurement work that they are involved in now that might be worth sharing with the group. Uh, happy to dig, dig more into it later, but um, really just an open forum, I guess. Oh, I see uh, Holly here had to go, but number of badges will grow when Florida starts issuing them for gen ed career opportunities at public universities. Uh, very good point. Uh, not a Midwest state, but we uh, they are a, a partner of Credential Engine. Rachel's been very involved with, with Florida. Um, and so um, that's an opportunity as states collectively um, act regarding badge technology. That's a huge lever. And I, uh, I'm not going to call on anybody, but I know the state of North Dakota has uh, identified badges as a key component, too, of, of, many of their initiatives. So uh, it's great to, to think about uh, states uh, engaging with badges directly. OK. Um, all right, well. Um, I think we are actually on time with our agenda, exactly surprisingly, on time. <laughs> surprisingly enough. Um, so unless there's any other uh, questions or uh, comments, what I'll do is make sure I get the link to the EdTech Advisory Group, put that in the chat, welcome folks to join in, and then turn it to Annika, I think, to help us with the next part of our dis small group discussions. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so at this point, we're going to do some state sharing in breakout rooms. So I'm going to open up um, two breakout rooms. You'll be automatically assigned. Um, you should see a message pop up on your screen um, asking you to enter the room, um, at which point just click on that and you go in. Um, if anyone has any trouble getting into their room, um, I'm happy to help move you manually. Um, in our first room, we'll be uh, just 
lightly facilitated by Jen Briones at Credential Engine, and room two will be lightly facilitated by Sarah Appel at MEC. Um, and the purpose of this is just to share um, some work that you're doing um, in your state or your organization around credential transparency and some of the things we heard today, um, and to just exchange ideas for a little bit of time. So I'm going to go ahead and open those rooms now. Hey, Sarah, same? Mm -hmm. um, our group talked, uh, again, very broad, uh, but we talked about a, a couple issues that, that kind of came up. One of them uh, was uh, financial aid for uh, funding uh, certifica certifications and credentialing. That seems to be a, a large barrier, a large major challenge for folks who are interested in areas such as uh, police academies or uh, first responders, um, that it's not necessarily included any kind of federal financial aid package or Pell Grant or scholarship, um, and they have to pay it out of pocket, which can be, you know, uh, quite a difficult uh, task for some. Another one was having more communication with employers, um, and that works both ways, uh, with the employers uh, and the institutions and the institutions with the employers to make sure that everybody has those expectations um, out uh, on, on right up front about what the students uh, will be learning and uh, making sure that they're ready then for their workforce. And uh, the third one um, is really looking at some what's going on in some of the states, especially uh, middle school. Um, we we talked about a uh, program, you know, some things going on in Illinois where they're really starting to work with um, younger children to help them uh, do some career exploration activities and help them think about um, pathways then uh, to what they want to do uh, as they get older. And we felt that that was really important to do that at such a younger age, as opposed to waiting for the last minute when you're a senior in high school. So uh, I think those were some of the, the major uh, topics that uh, we discussed. And if anybody from the group uh, wants to mention more, please do so. Um, but it, it was really good. It was a great engaging conversation. Great. Thank you guys both for sharing and for facilitating. Um, and uh, folks would probably notice a group of sort of, our group has dwindled. Um, I think a lot of folks have um, ongoing meetings still for the rest of the day. So I think at this point we can um, wrap up this meeting and just say thank you to everyone for uh, sticking it out and joining our conversation today. And uh, we will be sharing all of the um, the recording as well as the slides and materials from today's meeting will be posted on MEC's website um, in the next day or two. Um, and we'll send out an email with links to that information as well. So you can have it and share it with any colleagues that may not have been able to attend today. And uh, thank you again for being with us. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone.